Hi, everyone. Welcome to Kimbali 2020, a Rebuild Bali Festival, a digital program designed to inspire, excite, reconnect, and revitalize the Balinese and Indonesian community from the 29th of October to the 8th of November. Kimbali, the Indonesian word for return or come back, represents revitalization in the face of global challenges. The festival will unite people in Bali and Indonesia together with an international audience at a time when travel is largely impossible and creating connections is more important than ever before. And I'm happy to be here today with Jonathan Safran Foer, novelist, novelist and nonfiction writer. And today we'll be discussing your most recent book, We Are the Weather, Saving the Planet Begins at Breakfast. Hello, Jonathan. Hello. I, I wish we were, uh, well, frankly, anywhere other than uh, looking into computer screens right now, but Bali sounds pretty great to me. <laughs> and uh, it's my hope that maybe next year or the following year, we'll be able to have this conversation there. Oh, I hope so as well. Um, were you initially going to be traveling to Bali for this festival? Um, I, it was certainly my my hope. Um, but, uh, you know, we, I remember when things, things started to shut down, it feels like a hundred years ago in what, February or March. And there was that strange time when nobody knew who was overreacting and who was underreacting. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually feels like we're, I don't know how I know that you're in Montreal. I'm in New York and Brooklyn and it feels like we are just now entering that moment as well when it's unclear who is overreacting and who's underreacting. Oh yeah, we are absolutely in that moment here for sure where, where we, we're in a lockdown supposedly, 28 day lockdown in Montreal, but some people are not uh, adhering to the guidelines and the guidelines themselves are rather murky. So yeah, so we are in the, that. The, the French Canadians perhaps? Are they... uh, well, I mean, we're we're all we're all the, that mix up here in Montreal, and the, the 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 people who are are taking it more or less seriously are probably evenly spread out between various linguistic. I and guess that's hard back. in its own way. Yes, yes, I think we're all equally <laughs> equally uh, equally taking it too seriously or not seriously enough, but. Um, yeah, interesting. So um, I, I had actually, I had a ticket to be going to Bali for this. So I was really, I was very excited about it. But um, yes, as you say, hopefully in the future, we'll, we'll, we'll do a redo of this when, when, when your next book comes out. But today, it is We Are the Weather. And seeing as we are doing this interview shortly after breakfast time here in, in Montreal, in New York, Brooklyn, I, I guess I'm just curious, what did you eat for breakfast today? You know, it's a shame because obviously my, my book begs that question and I have done precious few interviews that haven't begun with that question. It's so, the answer I mean, is it's always so the, tempting. The answer is always the same, which is I'm not a huge breakfast eater. I typically just have oh my God. coffee. I know it's, it's a lame, uh, Way no, out, it's but, easy. But, it's easy. It makes it easy for you to follow the, the, the book's central dictum. Well, the book's central dictum is actually not that hard to follow in any case. Um, if, let's imagine, I were a big breakfast eater, um, I know that I would be very satisfied with some avocado toast, um, oatmeal. Uh, there are, for all of our meals, you know, we live in this moment of unprecedented choice, or I should say you and I do. Um, not everybody does. Um, and this is something that we can talk about maybe as the conversation advances. Um, it's not equally easy for everyone to change. Um, but for citizens of Europe, the US, Canada, um, and so many other places in the world right now, um, what we eat at our next meal really is an unconstrained choice. Um, and we've never had more options available to us or more information available to us about why certain options are uh, more destructive than others. So, um, you know, I, it, it is a bit of a joke that I just had a coffee, but the reality is there are a million things I could eat and be w without missing uh, animal products. Have you, have you been to Bali before? No, I never have. 
Um, I've only been once, but in, in my experience, it's, it's pretty easy to eat vegan there. I mean, everything from the, the tempeh to the tofu to the noodles and the curries, it's, a, it's kind of a, a place where eating vegetables just, just happens seamlessly and naturally. And um, so I was curious to know if you had any experience with Indonesian cuisine as well. I have, but it, only in New York. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the, the reality is almost all world cuisines are very easy to eat plant-based. Mm -hmm. um, frankly, it's uh, the American cuisine and to some extent, like the contemporary French cuisine are, are difficult. Um, but it, it also, I think, raises a point that's worth making, um, which is we don't have to look at it as it's easy to eat in Indonesia as a vegan, or it's easy to eat in America as a vegan. The way I would prefer to think about it and talk about it is it's easy in these places to move away from meat and to mm -hmm. move away from the most destructive kinds of, um, animal products. Um, and that might sound like a distinction without a difference, but, um, when we put it in terms of an identity, uh, that makes a lot of people have a reflexive anxiety or defensiveness mm. or just dismiss it out of hand and say, well, I'm not going to become a vegan. Mm. But if instead we put it in terms of <clears throat> recognizing our place in this cause and effect chain, recognizing what isn't ambiguous or controversial, which is that certain foods are more destructive environmentally than others, and that we want to um, cause as little destruction as possible. That's, I think, a universal value. Um, that, that, that's a way of talking about it that could bring about the same conclusions, but it's a lot easier for many people to approach. So, um, you know, the difference between saying in, in Bali, it's easy to, to eat as a vegan, or in Bali, it's, it's easy to eat less, eat, it's an easy place to eat less meat. Mm. Um, I think you'd find, mm. you know, very few people who are going to jump into that first statement, run, run, <laughs> run for that first statement with head speed, and 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 pretty much everybody that I've ever met or spoken to is open to that second formulation. So let's not be talking about becoming vegan. Let's talk about eating more plants. Is that is that the the way we should be? Yeah, just shifting the balance in our shifting the balance in our diets to be in keeping with what science tells us our diets need to be. Mm -hmm. which also happens to be shifting toward the past rather than some radical future. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our grandparents, it's, it's, a, it's a very new thing. Uh, it's one generation old, maybe two generations old, the notion that a meal is uh, the, the expectation that two thirds of our plate are going to be covered by animal protein. Mm -hmm. You know, historically, and this is really across cultures, we've eaten far more vegetables, grains, beans, and meat was used as a flavoring or as a garnish. Mm -hmm. um, in, in a lot of world cuisine, meat is hardly featured at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of interesting when I think of the, 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 the restaurants that before everything shut down in March, that were the most exciting here in Montreal, which isn't, which is another place that's renowned for its, its, culinary culture uh the places that were to me the most exciting really adhere to what you just described which is meat but in 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 a very moderate in a very minor way like mainly uh vegetable forward dishes but not being shy to to have some kind of like meat in the sauce let's say or meat as a as a very minor component, um, a flavoring component. So that's interesting that that's a, an ancient way or an older way of, of being. Yeah, and also chefs, you know, to their great credit have been taking the science seriously. Um, maybe that's because of an ethical stance or maybe it's just coincidental, you know, because a movement toward um, plant-based eating has become aspirational. You know, when I was in college, there were many more vegetarians than would admit to it because it was like a, it was a weird identity to have 
is maybe not exactly attractive, maybe a little bit strange. And now more people admit to it than actually are because it's become this aspirational identity. In America, a quarter, fully a quarter of people between the age of 25 and 35 identify as vegetarian. On American college campuses, there are more vegetarians now than Catholics. So we're not talking about something that's at the margins. We're talking about something that's at the center and expanding. And it's, you know, you can see it in the culture um, in terms of um, actors, musicians, artists, the kinds of people who are the storytellers are grossly disproportionately vegetarian. And <laughs> grossly. That, uh, that trickles down, you know? Mm -hmm. um, speaking about something that's at the center and radiating outwards, um, I, I kind of want to talk with you a little bit about the opening of We Are the Weather, which is a, a curious account of you vividly remembering a book from your youth, the, the Book of Endings. And uh, it contains, or it contained, several anecdotes which, which marked you in a profound way. But when you, tried to confirm the existence of this book of endings, you found that it didn't exist under that title. And that some of the key details which you recalled from that book were not in fact in that book at all. And you, you write that I must have learned about them elsewhere. And so I'm just, I, I, wanna, I wanna look at that for a moment. You, because you opened the book with that and you, as both a fiction writer and a, a writer of nonfiction, it's, it strikes me that in a way you're, you're using a technique of a, of a fiction writer a little bit in the beginning there to, to, to suggest a little bit that you're something of an unreliable narrator. Is that, am I, am I off base or, or am, I, am I seeing it that way? How, how, how do you see it? I don't know that I was thinking about it as um, that I am an unreliable narrator so much as um, things are not always remembered as they, as they were or as they seem at the time. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, and I, this is this may sound like I'm I, protesting too much or being naive, but I don't really think of myself as a novelist, and I don't really think of myself as a nonfiction writer. Hmm. I did not dream of becoming a writer. Um, There's nothing inevitable about that career choice. Um, there are all kinds of reasons, which there's not time or reason to get into right now, that I I happened into it. And I think I was lucky because of that, um, because I don't feel beholden to any idea of what it means to be a writer or an idea of what a novel or a work of nonfiction is. There's an old saying, or, or it's a kind of a joke, which is once upon a time, there was a man whose life was so good, there's no story to tell about it. Mm. Um, stories always arise out of a problem or a conflict or friction or something that's unresolved. And I very much right from that position of something is not correct in, inside of me. Um, and in the case of novels, I, I couldn't put my finger on what it is, but I have a sense of what the kind of atmosphere of the problem is. And I write about it with metaphor um, and, you know, projection through character and story. And in a way, a novel is an attempt to not to solve a problem, but to articulate a problem. And, and nonfiction is not so dissimilar. Um, there are things that have that sit uneasily in me that feel unresolved and problematic. The, the big difference is that I know what they are. Um, you know, with my first novel, maybe it had something to do with inheritance or something to do with Jewishness or something to do with silences in a family. I'm not exactly sure, but I know that the book is dancing around those things. With Eating Animals, my first nonfiction book, it's about eating meat. And, you know, there's, there's no really two ways of looking at it. And that's something that sat uneasily in me since I was a kid, since I was nine years old. And I had this babysitter who didn't um, eat the fried chicken that my older brother and I were eating and explained her choice um, not with, by the way, a lecture or argument, only because I asked why it was she wasn't joining us. And she said, I don't want to hurt animals unless it's absolutely necessary. And I found that utterly persuasive 
as a nine-year-old. And, um, you know, I still find it utterly persuasive as a 43-year-old. I've just found lots of ways of forgetting about it or ignoring it or uh, more generously recognizing all of the goods of food and meat eating and why it's not as simple as her formulation, even if it maybe ought to be. Um, but that was a discomfort inside of me. That was something that was not right. It didn't feel good. It didn't feel resolved. Um, and so I wrote nonfiction about it. But in both cases and in the cases of all of my books, they're born out of something in, uh, it's like a, uh, something in me that is not assembled correctly that I, that I want to try to organize. When you talk about this, um, there's, there, there's a lot of great points you brought up there. I, I feel like I could go in five different directions with that, but let's, let's start first off with, um, when you talk about there being a kind of uh, a problem at the heart of what is the the, 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 the kind of motor or the engine that, that impels you to be writing something, whether it be fiction or nonfiction, do you feel that We Are the Weather was a way of continuing or, or reassembling in some way what you had begun with eating animals? No, not at all. And I, I so regret that it would seem that way. And I, of course, understand why it would seem that way. It would seem that way to me if I were a reader. Um, I did not want to write about meat anymore. I actually felt very proud of eating animals. I, I said what I wanted to say. I figured out what I wanted to figure out for myself. Um, Where the Weather was born out of an extreme discomfort that I was feeling um, with regard to the choices I was making vis-a-vis -vis the environment. I was witnessing myself saying certain things to myself and to others about the importance of responding to climate change, um, attending marches, um, giving money to the right groups, um, you know, perfecting the kinds of little data points and anecdotes that virtue signal and that um, kind of relieve or soothe a uh, feeling of guilt, which is born, born out of knowing that so much more needs to be done than is being done at the level of systems and at the level of the individual my, in my own life. You know, I, so I, I, sorry, can you hear my dog in the background? <laughs> Yeah, he, he hates it whenever I talk about this. Um, <laughs> He's like, Jonathan, what did I tell you? What did I tell you? Yeah, not, no not the carbon talk, footprint no thing. Don't, don't, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, I, like so many people I know, bemoan the existence of climate deniers. And like so many people I know, my carbon footprint is almost without a doubt larger than that of the average climate denier. Um, and... I, I started to give more and more serious thought to the difference between what it is that we know, what it is that we care about, and what it is that we actually do. Because I think it's really easy to become confused and to believe that knowing and caring is doing, mm. you know, that um, watching uh, political, you know, uh, newscast is an, an act of, is, is a political action mm. or that um, being able to cite the most recent studies about the you know, speed of the melting of the ice sheets is to do something about it. Um, and I was doing very little, mm. uh, it, to, to be honest. And so I wanted to figure that out. I wanted to both figure out why it was that I could know what I, new and still do so little and also figure out what it is that one would do you know like like a lot of people climate change has made me feel powerless in, a, in an extreme way mm -hmm. and um made me feel that i'm the you know s s subjected to the whims of a uh, government or of corporations 
and that uh, I had to, you know, listen to the violinists play on the deck as the boat sank. Um, and I wanted, to, I wanted to find out if that was indeed the case or if there were things that we can do. Um, okay, let's, let's, let's continue with this. Let's, I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in this idea between knowing and caring and doing, and I, wanna, I do want to go with that, but maybe let's come to it. Let's go momentarily connect back to this, this thing you said when you were talking about what a good story is and you had that anecdote, an old anecdote. What was it again? Uh, once upon a life, excuse me, once upon a time, there was a man whose life was so good. There's no story to tell about it. Okay. Well, this is interesting because one of the things that you, you write about in we are the weather is you say that the planetary crisis hasn't proved to be a good story, right? That it, that it, that it not only fails to convert us, it fails to interest us and to captivate and to transform are the most fundamental ambitions of activism and art, which is why climate change as subject matter fares so poorly in both realms. Um, I mean, that, first off, what, what, what do you think hearing the, those lines now in the context of that anecdote? Well, I think I was right. Um, I think that, <laughs> um, you know, I have read an awful lot of books about climate change. I've seen documentaries. I have been moved very deeply, but never in a sustainable way. Um, I think it's so important to be honest about this, even though it risks embarrassment or worse, because there's no moving forward without being honest about this. Um, and I'm curious to hear your experiences as well. Mm -hmm. I have devoted a good part of the last couple of years to thinking about climate change and individual action. Um, I have kids, um, so I have that particular sensitivity to what the future will look like. And yet, if I'm being honest, the truth is I basically don't care. Like, I care when there are contexts to care. So if there's like a march, I will care. We are right now having a conversation, so I care. The second we're done with the conversation, I'm going to go back to my life. Maybe there will be some residue of this conversation, and I will feel inspired today to try to make better choices. If I'm being honest, my guess is that residue will wash away pretty quickly because we have busy lives to attend to, and so many things are asked of us, and climate change is both really profoundly complicated um, and it cannot help but feel distant, even when it's not distant. It feels like something that happens to people halfway around the world, or it feels like it's something that's going to happen in the future. Um, so the combination of that complexity and distance makes it very hard to sustain any high degree of care about. Well, what do you make of, of the, the impact that, that Greta, Greta Thunberg has been having on younger generations, but also just the world at large. It seems like she is somebody who is connecting in a way where that residue is, seems to be having a, having a hold on people. What do you think? Well, clearly it, she has. Um, Trump has as well. Um, you know, I think they are in a contest for who is the most important environmentalist of <laughs> our time. Um, Greta Thunberg does it. Um, by modeling what concern and action look like. Trump has done it by modeling ignorance and inaction. But they've each, in their own very different ways, awakened us. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know to what extent that awakening is deep and sustaining mm -hmm. or sustainable, or if it will have a flash in the pan quality. <laughs> Um, you know, do the people who, and I would include myself among them, who are, are so moved by what Greta Thunberg has to say, are we going, is it, are we going to, what, what are we going to do with those emotions? Mm -hmm. Are they going to become, are they going to refer to themselves? Are they going to 
make us feel like better people or are they going to motivate us to do the necessary work? Um, you know, she has so much influence right now and she has brought, she has sort of done the first step, which is bringing this crisis to the broad global consciousness. I hope that like the next step in her journey will be to ask specific things um, of the people who listen to her and follow her. Um, you know, Greta Thunberg is a vegan for environmental reasons, uh, as is Al Gore. It would be wonderful to hear her talk about that more and to ask it of the young people who really do hang on her words and her leadership. Um, you know, thus far we have had school boycotts. Um, I, I would so much rather see boycotts of industries that are destructive. Um, school is not destructive to the climate. Um, but if she could persuade her millions and millions of followers, I don't, I don't think she would prefer to you that. I don't, I don't know that she cares for that kind of language of followers and leaders, mm -hmm. but yeah. the reality yeah. is people do follow her. Um, if she could persuade them to boycott beef, I think we would see some really profound changes very, very quickly. Mm. Is, is it that she's connecting also with, I mean, she is mainly connecting with a younger generation, right? Like a, a generation that, that I don't know how old your, your kids are, but the, the, I assume that are under 15. Yeah. The 14 and 11. So that, that age, it seems to me that that's, I mean, I have no idea what her demographic really is, but it seems like it's, it's, it's young people. And it seems like they are very much, when you talk about your own interest in this subject stemming from the fact partially that, that you have kids, that you come from it with that sensitivity, and they are the kids and they are connecting with Greta's message in a way that may be different from us. I mean, is that, is that from our generation and from older generations? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, anecdotally, it, it kind of sounds right what you're saying. On the other hand, I don't know that my kids give a shit <laughs> you know mm -hmm. they're they're doing their own thing um you know they watch her and think it's interesting but i don't think they're actually moved in the same way that i am um, interesting. she speaks so i mean clearly I it depends the, on kid, the kid it depends on the kid of course clearly it is the case that younger people have taken this up in a way that older people have not and that only makes sense both because they have so much more at stake yeah um they have not been the beneficiaries of this destruction. They're only going to be the people picking up the tab. Mm -hmm. um, and young people are by nature more political and by nature more able to change. You know, so if you tell a 14 year old what the science of um, climate change is and the relationship between eating choices and their future is, they will, by and large say, all right, so let's do this. Let's forget it. We'll eat less meat. We'll do this, we'll do that. Um, their eating habits are nowhere near as um, ingrained as, you know, our eating habits mm -hmm. are. Um, they're so much more enthusiastic about change, which is why historically there have always been more, um, you know, any kind of social justice has begun on college campuses. Um, and to some extent, high school campuses. And things like, um, choices like vegetarianism have also been, um, I will say grossly disproportionate again, because I know you liked it so much the first time. I love this. Uh, students are, uh, are in a grossly disproportionate way, uh, more likely to be vegetarians. So, okay, so, um, I mean, I, I'm, how about this a simple, simple um, question for a moment, um, rather than an, a, engaging in the, 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 the ambiguities here and some of the complexities of intergenerational political choice and all and, and such. But um, would you would you say that We Are the Weather is a book primarily about our environment, about a world facing 
crucial climate change is issues or or is it about animal welfare and about how we eat or is it about both of them no no it's very much about the first the first thing the uh, is about the environment and what it is that we can do as individuals um, we need systems to change and we need to change as individuals and we need to recognize the connection between the individual and the system and it's very much a book about um what how to live um as an individual in this moment of climate crisis so, um, and um one of the, the facts that i state early and it is a fact it's not an opinion and it's not controversial or ambiguous is that there are four choices we make as individuals that matter significantly more than all others which are our use of airplanes our use of cars how much meat or animal products that we eat and uh, overpopulation. Um, these things matter f far, far more than um, recycling, whether we use a plastic straw or a paper straw uh, and so on. So, um, but eating is different. It's a little bit different than those other three. 85% um, of Americans who own cars use them to drive to work. And most Americans, I am actually not included in this group because I'm lucky enough to live in New York, but most Americans live in cities that require cars and were designed to require cars. More than half of the flights that are taken in the U.S. are either for work or for non-leisure uh, personal purposes like visiting a sick relative. So we need to fly less. And I think coronavirus, one of the side effects is that it's shown us that we can fly less while continuing to do business um, mm -hmm. and be happy. Um, while we need to fly less, it's not as simple as, as saying we need to give up airplanes tomorrow. Um, but food is a choice that we make multiple times every day. And um, my strong assumption is that for everybody watching this, it is an unconstrained choice. Um, we have the ability to choose to eat meat for lunch or to choose to eat vegetarian for lunch or that vast middle to choose to eat less meat for lunch. Um, it's also the only one of those um, high impact acts that I mentioned that immediately addresses methane and nitrous oxide, which are two of the most powerful greenhouse gases. Methane is um, about 86 times as powerful as carbon and nitrous oxide is about 310 times as powerful, which matters because um, we have this ticking time bomb on our hands where if we don't um, you know, solve global warming in the next, some people say 10 years, some people say 20 years, some people say 30 years, then we will enter into um, um, uh, irreversible runaway climate change where these feedback loops will be set in motion that we can't undo regardless of what actions we take. Exponential so, destruction. Yeah. So we're, we are a family on a budget right now. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to pay the mortgage at the end of the month. Um, so we should look at our big ticket items first, you know, um, and our big ticket item, our biggest ticket item is animal agriculture um, in the, in the very near term. So uh, this is a book about, Yes, it does happen to be about animal agriculture, but that's only because I was writing about what it is that we can do as individuals in this moment. So the, 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 the umbrella situation is the, the, the environment and the world, the planet that we live on. And if we look as individuals, how can we do something? The conclusion that you draw, which as you say, it's a fact, There's, it's, not a, it's not an opinion, it's just the way it is, is if we were, were to reduce our consumption of animals that come from factory farms, that would have an effect. It's like, that's, that's one thing that we can do. Is it, is it, is it that simple? It is that simple. Um, it's, it's not as simple as if we do that, we're going to solve climate change. That would be a, um, radical oversimplification. We need mm -hmm. to, we're far beyond the point of I do this or I do that and mm -hmm. well into, I need to do this and that. Mm -hmm. So we do need to eat far less meat. 
um, the most comprehensive analysis of the relationship between animal agriculture and the environment was published in Nature magazine at the end of 2018. And the authors studied food systems all over the planet and found that while there are places where the only access to nutrition is meat, um, places where people are malnourished and where um, it's difficult for various reasons to grow other things, that people in such places could actually eat a little bit more meat and dairy. Mm. But for citizens of the UK, the US, Canada, um, Europe, we need to eat about 90% less meat and about 60% less dairy in order to um, avoid what they call irreversible climate collapse. Mm. Uh, the IPCC, which has become the kind of gold standard for climate science, has said that even if we do everything else that we're talking about um, with regard to fossil fuels and flying and driving, um, we have no hope. It's literally impossible. It will be impossible to meet the goals of the Paris Climate Accords unless we change how we eat. So changing how we eat will not save the planet, but we cannot save the planet without changing how we eat. It's interesting. Um... I love eating vegetables. I'm a, I'm a food lover and uh, I've been a food writer. And my, my first book was about fruits. It's called The Fruit Hunters. And uh, I didn't come at it from any kind of uh, a vegetarian or a, a vegan perspective. I just came at it from, you know, from the perspective of a, of, a, of a writer who found a topic and was fascinated with it. But as I, you know, as I move through my life, I, I, I love eating vegetables. And I think of the, you know, the best, the best things you can eat, like as you follow the seasons, it, it, it's vegetables. It's like not in my mind, it's almost like I'm, I'm curious if there has been, a, if we have appealed correctly to people's, uh, uh, you know, selfish gluttonous, gross sides by saying, Hey, it's not just that vegetables are a thing you gotta do. It's like, do you want to be enjoying the, the, the best stuff? I mean, you know, like, is that, I, I haven't, I, I don't, I haven't c kind of considered a lot of the, the, the prescriptive measures that you're talking about, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I don't, I don't come from that background, but I am fascinated with it, but I come from a background that is a little bit more um, interested in the, I guess, the, the, the sensory and the, the, the sensual as well. And I, I wonder if we have been, if you're aware of, of efforts that have been made to, to kind of target people's um, desires for, for vegetables rather than uh, targeting their um, sense of duty, you know, like I must, you know, eat this boring mush rather than like, man, like squash right now. Like, have, have you had a connection to squash at this moment? I mean, it's really like, amazing if you if you've had it and if you haven't i mean it's right there for you an acorn squash is everywhere and it costs nothing and you can have so many meals out of it and it's so good i just i just wonder what do you think have you have you noticed this this kind of an appeal well there's actually oddly enough been some real studies about this of late um and you are absolutely right in that that kind of appeal is far more successful than appealing to one's duty or mm. one's ethics. Um, and so I know a lot of groups that are interested in moving away from factory farming and moving toward eating more plants are shifting actually their rhetoric from mm. here are the reasons why we have to do this mm. to this is a great way to eat and this is really delicious. I mean, um, it's true, it's just true. I, I agree with you. I also think I, I, I would ha have to admit that like a steak is a singular like mouthwatering appetizing thing for most people. Um, a burger is as well. Uh, yeah, but it's not only, I, I think a large portion of our the way that we're drawn to meat is about stories, storytelling, but I don't think that's all of it. 
you know, I think that our, um, you know, caveman uh, ancestors who dropped that ribeye onto the fire and uh, ate it, uh, we are informed by that as well. So I think there's a balancing act between trying to correct the stories, as you're saying. I think that is a very powerful idea and having chefs kind of lead that charge mm -hmm. um, would really change the world. But it is also worth acknowledging that like, it can be hard to give up foods that we either have an evolutionary history or just a personal history of um, mm. desiring. It's very interesting. I mean, I, who am I to deny our caveman ancestry? I, I, I know I, I love a steak as well, but you know, I just feel like when I think of the things that make me most excited as an eater these days, it's not another burger and another steak, you know, it really is the, 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 the vegetables that are in season. And I mean, maybe that said as an inhabitant of a cold Nordic nation with a short harvest season that we are in the thick of, it was just Canadian Thanksgiving on Monday because our Thanksgiving has to be earlier than American Thanksgiving because the, <laughs> the harvest season ends now, but you know, we're, we're, we're surrounded by all these amazing you know, everything is still available, or at least for another little moment it is. And um, in this in this time of the year, I'm just like, how, like, who would prefer, I mean, it's, it's tough to prefer a steak over zucchini on the grill. I mean, it's just tough. It's like, you know, maybe come you, February. You are, we, you are a refined eater in the sense that you have knowledge of the possibilities. And this is yes. one thing that's really been taken from us, um, and not by accident. Um, you know, we have lost our sense of our full sense of like what meals are and what cooking is mm -hmm. and what farming is. We've become so detached from it and been trained, really actively trained to believe that eating is something to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. let's yeah. do it in as little time as possible. Let's get a, as big a meal as possible with as few components as possible. Mm -hmm. In America, about one out of three meals are eaten in a car. You know, just like think about that for a second. So depressing. It, you know, it's one thing to say, why can't people appreciate squash? Mm -hmm. um, but we have to recognize that I'm, I'm going to, I have, I have no, this is a guess. This is, I'm not basing this on any evidence. My guess is the majority of Americans don't know what a squash is. I've never, <laughs> I've never heard of a squash. And I've never seen a squash. It. And it's not their fault. It's not because they're ignorant. It's not because they don't desire to have, you know, um, a full and eclectic diet. Um, it's because of McDonald's and it's because of Burger King. And it's because of, to some extent, urban food deserts. And it's to a larger extent because um, it's in the interest of massive food corporations to streamline our ideas of what a meal is mm -hmm. and run them down a funnel that leads to what it is that they're selling. And um, it's been a huge disservice, um, obviously to the environment and obviously to our health, but also to what food can be, to mm -hmm. our expectations of what food can be. So, so many people just think of food as like, how can I get this out of the way? Yeah, you know, I know a lot of a lot of artists think that way as well. It's not, it's not just the 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 the, the mass of humanity. It's a lot of thinkers and intellectuals as well. You know, a lot of writers. A lot of writers are just like, get get me the nutrients I need in order to plow through this this next chapter. I don't yeah, I don't you, see it that way. I don't see it that know, way at all. I, I don't either. It used to be that you worked very hard so that you could eat basically. So you could enjoy meals with your family and um, you know, they would take an hour or two to prepare and you would eat them over the course of an hour, always at a table that was set. And now we're, you know, eating our meals with the fingers of one hand in a car. We are eating quickly so that we can work more. 
rather than working so that we can eat more. So in a way, it brings up something that has always been at the back of my mind when I engage with writers, American writers who are trying to get across kind of rather simple messages in a way to the American population and the world population, but mainly American readers. And, you know, which is that you're, there's almost like this challenge, like somebody like myself is already, I'm already, you know, you're preaching to the converted, as they say, like, I'm already on board. I love vegetables. I love eating, you know, like you, I don't need to be hearing this, but how do you, like you're, the, the, the challenge is to try to cross that gulf of, you know, to, to reach those people who are having three meals a day in their car or whatever it is, two meals a day. I don't remember. Was it three meals a day in their car? Is that what you said? Uh, one, one out of three. Yeah. Okay. One out of three meals in their car. Yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, daily. I mean, that's just so unbelievable. But, but um, the, in a way, the battle that you are fighting, it seems to me is a battle with ignorance and, and you're trying to educate or shed light and or bring light to people um do you do you feel that that is is happening do you feel that that is possible well it's certainly happening um you can look at the eating habits on college campuses and among high school students as evidence that it's happening um the question is you know it, it, it will happen. The question is, will it happen in time? Uh, and how do we accelerate it as much as possible? And this kind of brings us back to the beginning of our conversation with whether to look at it as a question of identity or a question of moderation and being responsive to what we know. So if you were to ask me, what are the odds that half of Americans will be vegetarian in five years, I would say zero. There's no chance of that. If you were to ask me, what are the odds that half of the meals eaten in America will be vegetarian meals in five years? Mm -hmm. I actually think there's a very good chance of that. Um, that those will bring about the same outcomes, but they're in terms of the reduction of environmental destruction, reduction of, you know, animal cruelty and so on and so forth. But they're very, very different ways of thinking about it. Um, so, you know, I think the, the most important first step in this process is telling the story in a way that is useful rather than just true. Mm. Um, there are a lot of different ways to tell a true story. Um, some set us up for success and some set us up for failure. You know, I, I pretty much every reading I ever do or used to do public reading, somebody would come up to me, oftentimes a bunch of people and say, Hey man, I read your book. I've been a vegetarian for three weeks going strong. And I used to just be um, kind of purely excited about that. And over the last couple of years, I've had a different response, which is that's, that's great that you were, you were moved by the information, but make sure you're setting yourself up for success and not for failure. Like if you are a vegetarian for three weeks, at some point that person is going to eat meat it, or at least it's, if they are like most people. Mm -hmm. And then what, you know, what if after 60 meals, uh, vegetarian meals, they uh, eat meat, um, then they have failed. Laps. And they, they're no longer vegetarian. I meet so many people who say, I was a vegetarian for three years. I was a vegetarian for five years. I was a vegetarian for 12 years. And then what happened? Oh, well, I ate a burger. And then it's done, you know, because they're no longer vegetarian. If instead, if instead the person, because, you know, identities are binary. If instead the person said, I've been thinking a lot about the science, the information, and, um, I, I've decided I'm going to eat as little meat as possible. And for three weeks, I haven't eaten any. If on that 61st meal, the person has a burger, they can say, man, 60 out of 61 times, I, my choices reflected my values. 
that like gets you into the hall of fame you know if you're batting 60 out of 61 that seems like an incredible success beyond any what anybody's expectations could have been even though it's exactly the same as the person who was trying to be vegetarian and then failed or lapsed so i think finding ways to shift the conversation away from these binary identities and toward participation in this big project um, that I think is informed by universal values will have a lot more success. Pretty interesting. Um, it feels like we live in a time where we are moving away from looking at at identity as a binary, that we're in a time where identity is a spectrum. I mean, I'm, I'm from a place that is obsessed with identity, Quebec, you know, French Canadian corner of the world, a corner of North America, you know, where identity here is a very all consuming idea. And one of the things that I see is that in the same way that I guess in, in terms of gender, we're, we're, that we're seeing that gender can be a spectrum and that, 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 that identity there can be fluid I wonder if it's not the same, you know, you, 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 if we're talking about our, you know, the binaries of how we eat in a way, what you're suggesting is like moving away from that. And, and that, that, that we can be somewhere, you know, I don't know what you're so, so you, you did in the classic American analogy of the, the, the grand slam, uh, you know, wherever that was on the rainbow of, uh, of percentages. Um, but you know, there's, there's this word flexitarian, Right. I mean, is that what is that? I don't even know what that word really is. I've only heard it in the reading your book. What is a flexitarian? I don't exactly know. Um, <laughs> but it's another I don't I don't even think that term is so useful. I think that, you know, the, the terminology, we think it's going to make us feel good to be able to put a word to our choices. In the end, it almost always makes us feel bad. Um, I prefer violence approach. to naming. Yeah. I, 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 have for, I prefer the approach of I know what I know and I'm going to try to live in response to it. Um, as with almost every other like ethical category in my life, I'm not going to be perfect. Like I think it's a good idea to tell the truth, but I occasionally tell lies. I think it's you know a good idea to give money to homeless people, but I occasionally ignore them. Uh, you know, each of us I'm sure could think of a hundred examples like this where imperfection doesn't undermine the project. Um, it's a good idea to move away from meat. Um, we all need to eat less of it. For some of us, uh, the amount that we end up eating will be zero. Um, and I, I do think that's the ideal outcome. Mm -hmm. It's certainly what I am trying to do in my own life but it is not the only way to um, like responsibly respond to this climate crisis. It's also not what's necessary. You know, mm -hmm. um, that study that I cited mm -hmm. said that we need to eat 90% less meat and 60% less dairy. Um, and that's by the way, not something that we need to do all at once over and about the next 90, That's 90% for the average big time meat eating carnivore who's eating meat all the time, right? Well, it's 90% for the average citizen, whatever that amount is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this is like a 10 year project. So uh, again, if you were to ask most viewers of this, can you eat 90% less meat next year? I think, I think if they were being honest, most people would say no. Mm -hmm. Can you eat 9% less next year? and then 9% less the next year, and then 9% less the next year. Um, turning it, shifting from the idea that it's an event to a process makes it, first of all, makes it logistically far more possible, but also psychologically, it makes it much easier to sign up for. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I think that it is totally possible for everybody to reduce a certain percentage of their meat consumption, no matter who they are. I mean, and it's, again, if we, you know, if we, if part of the, the narrative there is that, that this is what you want to be eating, you know, not just what you have to be eating, but like, you know, let's, let's tap into the, the, those desire lines and, and make you excited about it because it is exciting. I mean, if you like, 
I mean, if you can, if you can make the shift from, you know, cramming uh, nuggets down your gullet it, behind the wheel to, uh, you know, having a meal you like, but that's, that's, you know, I guess that is the question. That is the, therein lies the, 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 the question. Can people move from this just, you know, perfunctory rote, you know, getting the getting of the nutrients the unpleasant getting of the nutrients to maybe taking some pleasure uh, in their meal. And then well, also, if- also we now have alternatives to the nuggets and burger, you know, there are now plant-based versions of those things. That it's true. It's true. I, I, I don't think are great solutions, you know, for the rest of time to, to eat like mm-hmm. we've been eating, but eating plant-based versions of those, but <laughs> they are very helpful actually. And, they're a good, I think, transition. Um, yes. And they also will serve a function. You know, there are times when an awful lot of people just go to fast food because they're, they have to, you know, they're on a drive or something like that, or they only have for whatever reason that day, a few minutes to just grab something. That's all that's nearby. Simply having those as options and they are vastly less destructive um, environmentally is, is a wonderful change. You've, you've, you've kind of tiptoed around a few things, danced around a few things that I find really interesting that are kind of, um, I guess, kind of, kind of philosophical about, about, about you've, you've spoken about being honest, uh, being the most important thing, but then, you know, to be honest means recognizing that sometimes you lie and that sometimes, um, that sometimes, you know, you can't be what you exactly what you want to be um and i guess there's something you know you, t- you talked earlier about um the idea of uh knowing and caring as well as doing or versus doing but i i i want to come to i want to come to an anecdote that you've written about but first maybe just on this purely idea level first before we look at it with an example um like, is it hard for us as, as human beings to, for, for our, va- our values to, to always line up with the, the, the actual choices that we make? I certainly find it tough. Um, I assume everybody does because our values so often ask us to refrain from things that we love, um, to refrain from things that we crave, sometimes at a very deep primitive level. Um, and it can be a really profound struggle to hold those cravings in check. Um, and they are by no means constrained to food. You know, people have a hard time being in monogamous relationships over time. Um, people have a hard time being honest, um, People have a hard time giving the amount that their values would suggest to charity Mm. because we like having stuff. Um, So we're used to this struggle. There's nothing new about it. It's as every day as the morning coffee. Um, And it doesn't have to be threatening. And imperfection doesn't have to be threatening. We have so much experience with it, but we have this fear of hypocrisy that can lead us to be afraid of even trying at all. It's interesting because it seems like you have been confronting in a way openly this, this fear of hypocrisy. I mean, even earlier you alluded to, it may be embarrassing to do this, but you're kind of like, okay, well, let's be embarrassed about it. You know what I mean? Like, is, 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 is that fair to, to say? Like, there's a few things that in your, in, your, in your work where you seem to be saying, like, I need to go into this hypocrisy that in a way is a thing that makes us who we are. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's more comfortable to pretend that we are, we are better than we are in the sense of um, knowing what's right and doing it, but it doesn't actually get us anywhere. I don't even think it makes us feel good over time because inside we know 
the truth, which is that, you know, we, we, I say we, I, I am just assuming other people are like me in this way. Um, we struggle to do what's right, right by our own definitions. That's what's so peculiar about this. It'd be one thing if we had somebody um, wagging a finger, telling us this is what you need to do. We have a hard time agreeing with them or caring about it and acting on it. In so many cases, it's just what we want to do, what we believe is right, our own values. And yet it becomes complicated as a person living in the world, um, you know, embedded in the like logistics of, of being a person, but also the cravings of being a person. Mm. Well, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but I think a little bit still. Um, and I'd mentioned that I wanted to get, get into a specific anecdote. And I want to bring this up. Uh, first off, as, as we just discussed, you know, this, the, this ability you have to, in a way, openly confront things that we all deal with. And it also relates to what you were saying earlier when you, when you, when you meet these new vegetarians who've been recent converts as a result of reading your, your words, you know, and they say like, almost like an AA member, like I'm three weeks deep and you're like, okay, but you know, you're going to, you're going to have a relapse or whatever you're going, and you're saying maybe you, you've been, you've been trying to shift the, the way we talk about that to make it a little bit easier to actually accomplish. And, and so I, I, I read this, this thing that you wrote, I don't, I don't remember exactly where, but you're, you were talking about, it must've been a few years ago about how you were on a book tour and how you ended up at airports and you would, you would end up eating meat where, you know, which is usually burgers. This is what you wrote, which is to say meat from precisely the kinds of farms I argued most strongly against. And my reason for doing so makes my hypocrisy even more pathetic. They brought me comfort. I mean, in a way, it's it's a very courageous thing to write, you know, to 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 own the the as you say the hypocrisy, but to not only own it, to just kind of be like, ah, but it's true, it happens, right? I mean, this is where you're talking about the butting up against these primal instincts with these values that we have. I mean, how how does that revelation strike you today? Embarrassing. Um, and but you're okay with being embarrassed. No, not really. But I thought that it would be helpful to other people who, like me, care and want to be a part of the repair of the world rather than the destruction of the world, but are also human beings and not just philosophical machines, mm -hmm. um, not ethical machines. And when somebody shares their ethical achievements with me, I usually find it annoying, you know, in, in a weird way, I have this kind of reflex of almost getting angry, you know, <laughs> if someone, I almost want to like offset their good deed with a bad deed, you know, um, when somebody shares their struggle with me, I find that inspiring, you know? So if somebody approached me and said, uh, you know, I've been reading about airplanes and uh, their, in, their implications in the environment. And um, so I'm just never going to fly again. You know, I would probably think like, well, good for you, asshole. <laughs> you know, <laughs> fuck off. Um, if somebody instead says to me, I've been reading about airplanes and learning about their effects on the environment and man, I don't know what to do because I have to fly for work sometimes. And like, I just don't get that much vacation. And when I do, it's so important to me to like go see parts of the world. And I have kids and I want to show them what other parts of the world are like. And I think there's even something good and recognizing how narrow my way of doing things is and being exposed to other people's ways of doing things and other cultures and I don't, I don't know what to do. And I'm like wrestling with it. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm thinking maybe for, I can start with by saying in summer, I won't fly. If somebody approaches me like that, I think, Ooh, that's really interesting. And like, I, I'm like that too. I, I share that um, problem. 
I feel inspired to participate. Um, so in the interest of honesty, but also in the interest of usefulness, I wanted to share my own struggles. Um, I didn't want to write a book that was a lie, but I also didn't want to write a book that sounded great, but wasn't actually helpful. It's interesting because here we are, you know, we're talking, you, you brought up these four central, you know, big ticket items that are things that we need to change. We don't have a choice. Food is one we've been mainly talking about, but fly, flying being another one of them. Um, and here we are, the world has in a way forced us to drastically reduce our flying and is it possible that the, the world might have something like this up its sleeve in terms of forcing us to change the way we eat as well? And we then have no choice but to adapt. I mean, we've all had to adapt to this change in, in flying. And I mean, I have no idea what the figures are like in terms of like what flights have, are like now compared to the past decade up, you know, before March, but they must be much less than they were, right? Yeah, of course. Do you, do you know anything about where, where we're at there? I don't. Uh, it, it, but you're right that the world will force change upon us. Um, we are going to eat less meat. We are going to fly less. Um, and th th those are the easy changes that are going to be forced on us. We're also going to have to move away from coastal cities. We're going to have to accommodate annual forest fires and air pollution, um, flooding, superstorms, climate migration, climate famines, um, more uh, infectious diseases like COVID. Mm -hmm. um, again, three out of four of which originate on factory farms. There is no future where we're not making big changes. The question is, are we going to choose which changes we make now which will be relatively small, even if they're difficult, or will we be subject to changes later, which will be far, far more difficult to adapt to. So we have this window of time where it is a choice, um, but there is no future uh, near or long-term where we're not making significant changes. I mean, that seems like a great place to be ending. Oh, I just, I'm looking here. I've been getting texts. Our time is up. Apparently, I don't know. Did you see that? Did you see that? Our time was up. Uh, is, that, is that meant in, in the sense of our conversation or in the grander sense of <laughs> our time is unfortunately uh, in terms of the planet, Jonathan? Yeah. Um, no, in terms of this conversation, which was fascinating, we've gone a, a, about eight minutes over, it seems like. But I first off would just like to say thank you. It was a very illuminating and fascinating conversation. I enjoyed it very much. And thank you, of course, it, of, of course it went over, but um, I would also like to say thank you to Kimbali 20 for allowing us to have this conversation. And in closing, I am to tell all viewers that Kimbali 20 was made possible with the support of the Yayasan Mudra Swari Saraswati patron program and their donors. The patron program was created to seek assistance for the sur survival of both festivals, that being the, the food festival and the literary festival, which they have brought together into this single one that we're participating in, and the foundation. By making a valuable contribution to the Yayasan patron program, you will be directly involved in delivering both festivals in due time. Your contribution will guarantee the future of Indonesia's most meaningful cross cultural platform of words, ideas, cultural, and the creative arts. Follow at Ubud Writer, Writers Festival on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Ubud Writers Festival, or visit ubudwritersfestival.com for more information about the patron program. Ah, we did it. Your accent you is... Day. <laughs> when I was when I was nailing Yayasan for the first time ever, Yayasan. I mean, it feels great. Um, yeah. Thank you, Chef's Kiss. Um, great chatting it. with you. I hope we'll we'll be able to have uh, we'll be able to do this in Bali together 
in 2023 or somewhere like that. Maybe that even 2021. Who knows? Oh, let's hope. Uh, Jonathan, I, I, I do hope. Day. I do hope. You too. All right. Bye-bye.